Uh, hola, uh, hello. Um, uh, today is the 13th of April, uh, 2023, and uh, uh, we pay homage to Bernard Rudowski, who wrote a, a well-known book called Architecture Without Architects. And uh, um, let us begin. It's a fascinating subject because often architects think that architecture cannot do without architects, and it's simply not true. Even an architect that is very admired today, like uh, Lebia Suds, said that architecture has to be done by architects. But I'm not sure at all. And, and, and what, what Bernard Rudowski called architecture without architects, prove it uh, powerfully. But what do we see here? We see the sculpture by Constantin Brâncușic in Romanian is called Cumințenia Pământului. The, you know, the, the wisdom of the earth, maybe, in translation. It is a, a sculpture that I, I like very much. In its uh, ap apparent primitivism is uh, indeed uh, emanating uh, a wisdom that the so-called civilized man forgot. Is the wisdom of the earth. And uh, this wisdom of the earth, in our uh, blindness, because I cannot call it otherwise, uh, uh, we forgot. Maybe we should reflect uh, uh, on, uh, on, 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 on the meanings of this, uh, of this uh, beautiful uh, sculpture and uh, on what the earth is. Le Corbusier. And uh, he made this statement when he was 22 years old, when he was crossing the southeastern um, uh, southeast uh, Europe. And amazingly, we are talking about Le Corbusier. Well, future Le Corbusier, he was still young. He wrote this, which is, uh, which is this um, quotation is from a book, Journey to the East, which he made when he was around 22 years old. And it is an amazing and a paradoxical quotation. There is nothing more lamentable than this mania of today to disown tradition for the sole purpose of creating the coveted new, new in between quotation marks. Let's read again, because this cannot be from Le Corbusier, and yet it is from Le Corbusier. There is nothing more lamentable than this mania of today to disown tradition for the sole purpose of creating the coveted new. Wow. Uh, here was uh, uh, Bernard Rudowski, the author of the book Architecture Without Architects, a very interesting Austrian uh, architect. Uh, here he is, Bernard Rudowski, Architetto, uh, well, on the cover of a book. Uh, by that uh, writer, I guess, Hugo Rossi. And this is a fragment of the cover of, of the first edition of the book. There were several editions published, Architecture Without Architects, Bernard Rudowski. Uh, and uh, it is a moving book. And the very idea of the book is moving. Because I think we have to have the courage to recognize you know, that there is even genius in people whose names we do not know. After all, do we know the names of the builders of the Charter Cathedral? No. Well, they had master builders, of course, very knowledgeable, but an anonymously so. But they didn't erect the, the cathedral by themselves. They were surrounded by older people, women, children, Everybody contributed to the, the rebuilding of Chartres Cathedral in just 25 years. They rebuilt it because the first one uh, fell uh, uh, prey to, um, to fire. In 25 years, a little town, 25,000 people, Chartres in the Middle Ages, in the 12th century, rebuilt Chartres Cathedral, and it's, it's, a, it's a sublime cathedral, while New York City, which has uh, over 50 million people, all the technology in the world, all the money in the world, they cannot finish 
St. John the Divine Cathedral, which is essentially a pastiche. It's the largest cathedral on earth, but it's, it's a pastiche. It is impressive through its dimensions, but it cannot be finished. And it's not because there is no money or technology. No, or people. Faith is missing. Exactly that faith that is the last word of the short Bauhaus Manifesto that Walter Gropius wrote in 1919. So in 1919, the founder of the Bauhaus wrote a short manifesto, which ends with this very word. And it's truly short, that manifesto, like half a page, face. And twice in that short manifesto, he uses the word heavens. Not to speak about the fact that he, he, he differentiates between the craftsman and the artist, both being rooted in craft, but, but uh, he said that the artist is an exalted craftsman, that is, arrived at exaltation. Well, how many architects today are exalted? But these people, these humble people without names, built incredible architecture, non pedigreed architecture, as Bert Bernard Rudowski called it, architecture without architects. So in this book, Bernard Rudowski steps outside the narrowly defined discipline that has governed our sense of architectural history and discusses the art of building as a universal phenomenon. He introduces the reader to communal architecture produced not by specialists, but by the spontaneous and continuing activity of a whole people with a common heritage acting within a community or communal experience. A prehistoric theater district for 100,000 spectators on the American continent and then under, and underground towns and villages, complete with schools, offices, and factories inhabited by millions of people are among the unexpected phenomena he brings to light. The beauty of primitive architecture has often be, been dismissed as accidental, but today we recognize in it an art form that has resulted from human intelligence applied to uniquely human modes of life. Indeed, Rudowski sees the philosophy and practical knowledge of the untutored builders as untapped sources of inspiration for industrial men trapped in his chaotic cities. New York, the Museum of Modern Art, published on the occasion of the exhibition, Architecture Without Architects, shown at the MoMA, in 1964, from November 9th, 1964 to February 7th, 1965. And now I show images from the book, all amazingly fresh and new to the dogmatic, bureaucratized, tamed architect. I mean, how many architects today would be like this? Almost none. Almost none. And how do you explain it? We have money, we have enlightened uh, beneficiaries or clients, we have technology, but we don't have heart any longer. We don't have soul. We don't have that soul that Stephen Hall said is more important. Well, the ideal is more important than the real. He said, um, uh, you know, remain idealistic. Stephen Hall said, remain idealistic. The soul needs the ideal more than the real. But this is not the conception of the highly trained but tamed architects of today. They would not be like this. No. And now, of course, we have our own problems. We have, you know, hundreds of millions of people. You know, we have billions of people. You know, but, but we move a lot. We are not building for a certain place where we live. We do not live where we build. That's a problem. You know, we build for some, some place on earth, but not our own place. And this way we are very different from the mollusk because Gaston Bachelard was correct when he differentiated or opposed the mollusk to the human being. He said the mollusk, the mollusk doesn't build in order to live, doesn't build its house in order to live, but lives in order to build its house. This is a fundamental difference. 
the house of the mollusk is is the the um, uh, is the the culmination of a lived life is the expression of a lived life just like these buildings are expressions of the of, of the lived lives of the builders these these people build their buildings not in order to quickly move in and watch tv as we do but 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 the buildings are intrinsic uh, uh, proofs of their lives and not just not just the connection with the outer world with what we call the landscape but also intimate accurate uh, uh, affectionate expressions of their own inner world imagination memory uh, longings maybe nightmares the soul the soul what is this word a student many years ago at columbia university in new york told me that this word does not exist on the campus of uh, columbia university well i don't know if he was quite right because stephen hall teaches at columbia university and it was him who said the soul needs the ideal more than the real now of course we have to 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 explain to ourselves first what does he mean by the idea what is the idea i look at this uh, look at this uh, uh, you know should we call it uh, ruralism should we, should we call it uh, urbanism or should we should just get rid of ism at the end and i think we should you know this is the spontaneous order of nature but this is the spontaneous order of human nature because they built this uh, you know human settlement in this way which no architect with high training tamed as he or she is would do something like this because it would be considered irrational dangerous uh, uh, unhealthy when in fact it could be so but it's also magical uh, is archi our architecture magical very rarely look at this they are builders we only see the legs transporting a roof. I'm sure they enjoy themselves. Would we say the same thing about the highly trained architect of today? I doubt it. No, no, no architect today would transform, would transport with some colleagues or some friends or some neighbors a roof as these people do. It's a delicious photograph. Let's look at it again. Uh, look here. Would four architects today do something like this? Of course not. We are too serious. First of all, we are white collar architects, right? Professionals. We are professionals. We are specialists. We forgetting what Walter Gropius, again, the founder of the Bauhaus said. He was making fun of the specialist. He said, the specialist is the one who repeats the same mistakes over and over again. And Alvar Aalto also was an adversary, an enemy of the specialists. He was, they both were against specialization. And uh, Le Corbusier notoriously said that architecture is not a profession, but a state of mind. Well, here we have three, you know, if I can call them giants of the modern movement, saying almost the same thing. Again, we look at this picture. I feel that these people are enjoying themselves. You know, they are, yes, they die young, much younger than us. We have longer lives. We drag ourselves, you know, into the night, in the around 90, you know, being 90 years old. But, you know, maybe we never lived. Maybe we just laid on the sofa and watched TVs and did, uh, you know, standardized work in some office, bureaucratized work. You know, I, uh, I, I read recently that a, a famous... Uh, Roman Emperor uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, he, he said, uh, you know, we shouldn't be so concerned with, uh, you know, dying. We shouldn't be afraid of dying. We should be afraid of not starting to live. And I think many people, if not most people, do not start living. In fact, they die without living. And they die because they, because they, they, they rejected the very idea to start living. Many, many people are so. 
uh, yes, they escape to amusement parks. They escape if they have money to the expensive resorts. They ex 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 you know expel themselves from the realm of real life into some exoticism. But but in essence, they don't live. And look at these buildings. No student. In, at least in our university system, would, 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 would dare to imagine such a, such a container, such a building. No, no, no way. We have to use the T-square and the rectangle, uh, even uh, 30 years after the, the arrival of the computer, more than 30 years, actually. But this kind of um, voluptuous, almost container building is inconceivable, even by the imagination of a young student. Why? Because we are deprived of our connection with our deeper self. That's why. And we are afraid to dream. Yes, there are. Uh, if you are so kind, there is a noise in the background. Please turn off the microphone unless you want to say something. Thank you very much. I, I love these buildings. They are mysterious. They are different. They are other. They are unique. This happens that is from Romania and is in that book, <clears throat> Architecture Without Architects. Uh, this again done uh, by anonymous uh, anonymous builders. Greece, perhaps, Tibet, perhaps, Italy, or even in China, there is something like this. Uh, architecture without architects is. Uh, is a is a universal phenomenon actually. It can it can be found anywhere. And uh, anywhere where people are still themselves without uh, the dogma and the whip of uh, bureaucracy of uh, committees that need to stamp your drawing to give you the right to build. You know these people didn't did were not encumbered by 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 such. Uh, uh, restrictions and, and, and their freedom is manifest. Buildings without architects, the global guide to everyday architecture. You know, who taught these people to build? But they didn't need to be taught. The mollusk never studied for six years architecture in a university and builds magnificently. And so do the, you know, uh, the smallest insects. Sometimes, how do you explain it? You know, you know how, how do you explain it? That the smallest insect has the instinct to build magnificently without uh, going through torturous studies of architecture and exams and, you know, equations and subtracting and ad adding and learning techniques and so on. And who taught them? Look at this architecture. Is it architecture? Of course it is architecture. Is it beautiful? Yes, it is beautiful. But it was built by whom? We don't know. They didn't receive the Pritzker Prize. Now this is, of course, built by modern man. You know, the educated man. But is it better? Yes, uh, you know, the amplitude of the of the of the construction is uh, impressive in terms of you know of quantity yes we are confronted with uh, difficult problems at the planetary scale but why is it that we don't show much freedom because we don't you know it's it's very it's very sterile in a way it's very uh, restricted and restricting and very inhibited and inhibiting while here, it's life as lived, you know, and it's imaginative. Yes, again, it's easy to idealize what is not yours. But uh, as uh, Fernando Pessoa said, it must be beautiful in Australia as long as you don't go there. So it's possible that if I lived in this little village, I probably would have been less uh, appreciative. But from far away, it is seductive and aesthetically speaking is very seductive. Why is it that we build in this way? In a conventional architecture school, the student is uh, 
prohibit it to use such a cone? My God, this is seen like the, the extravagance of extravagances. Totally unacceptable. We don't have money for your crazy cones, said the professor. But these people were immensely poor, and, uh, and yet they built it this way. How do you explain it? Why didn't they just build so-called ra rationally, you know, uh, with uh, right angles and, uh, you know, um, in our uh, very, uh, you know, simplistic way? Why? These are pages from the book, Architecture Without Architects by Bernard Rudowski. I mean, I look at these steps and of course the professionally trained architect will say, how could this be? There is no parapet here for the stair. What if you fall? Well, I guess these people, like the person who entered the building, if they truly, truly needed uh, a parapet, they would have built it. But they thought that, you know, it's just uh, four steps, for God's sake. And of course, they didn't uh, know the, you know, the, the scientific objectivist formula to build it so-called so correctly. But that's how people built, you know, for their own lives. And they were happy like this. A look at this image also from the book. We don't even know what it is. It looks like sci sci-fi sci architecture, you know, science fiction architecture. Is this on the moon? No, it's, on, it's not on the moon, it's on the earth. But it's, 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 it's very interesting. It's very interesting and aesthetically uh, provocative. I mean, compare our blocks of flats with this. Or even with this, this is a beautiful building. It has rhythmicity, it has regularity, it has columns. It's, it's a box on columns, but I think it's very impressive. And it looks like it is, uh, to use a, an abused word these days, sustainable. Well, yes, the, the wood was obtained from cutting down trees. That is true. But this is a building which when fallen, it returns to the earth, that it disintegrates, uh, uh, you know, properly, so to speak, because it is built with organic matter, with organic materials. Did they know how to build? Yes, they knew how to build. This building is not built by unknowing people. I wouldn't even call this architecture primitive. In some respects, we are more primitive than they are or were. Uh, this, this, uh, this is a picture from the exhibition Bernard Rudowski Architecture Without Architects at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, from what I remember, he struggled to have this exhibition for a number of years. The museum wouldn't want to do it, but in the end, in 1960s, they agreed to do it, and I'm glad they did. Again, architects, uh, architecture without architects. And I, I would oppose to the architecture without architects, architects without architecture, because there are so many. Now look at this building, it's actually flowering. It's a flowering building in the spring, perhaps. You know, it's, it's magnificent. If you do something like this today, you know, it would be a wow architecture and it would be published on all e-signs and the magazines and so on. You know, but it was built by anonymous people. Anonymous people who knew how to build and who had sensitivity. And, uh, and uh, you know, this must be acknowledged. Or here again, you know, it's, for us, it's a fantastic architecture. <clears throat> for them, it's probably just a, a normal way of externalizing the, you know, their needs, their desires, their wishes. This is a beautiful book, one of the best books I ever had and have actually about architecture. It's, um, it's a volume from a beautiful history of uh, world architecture. The initiator of this uh, publicizing uh, effort was uh, Pierluigi Nervi, surprise, surprise, an engineer, 
but an engineer who was also an architect. And this volume is about what is called primitive architecture, which in my opinion is not primitive at all. Uh, in my opinion, our architecture often is more primitive. And look at this building, is it primitive? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, yes, there isn't much asphalt around the building. It's not built with concrete, but that's a good thing. This building didn't pollute when it was built. And uh, I don't know what its function is, but it sh shows clearly the logic of construction. The materials that I use start from, you know, they are not imported from China or I don't know from where. You know, they are from the place where they build the building. Primitive future, so Fujimoto, because Fujimoto uh, talks about uh, such an issue, primitive futures. This is a building by him that he proposed. It was not built, but uh, it's quasi primitive future. You know, it's quasi primitive because the, the shell, the wooden shell is still, uh, still operating within the Cartesian system. Unfortunately, but a desire from for the primitive uh, or primitiveness exists. Back to the real thing, meaning uh, you know, uh, architecture without architects. I don't know what this is. Uh, sorry, uh, pages from the book "Primitive Architecture" that we 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 we, we saw the cover of uh, another page from the same book, perhaps other images from the book, the richness, the richness and the beauty, the ingenuity, the surprising spontaneous, uh, spontaneousness of this, or spontaneity of this architecture is to be seen on every page of that book. Beautiful book indeed, and it can be purchased um, rather easily uh, today. Anyway, esoteric symbology of primitive architecture. Now I would ask you, could we, could we paraphrase this into esoteric symbology of modern architecture or esoteric symbology of contemporary architecture? What esoteric symbology? There is no esoteric symbology. In fact, this is oxymoronic. How could we have esot esoterism or esoteric knowledge or esoteric symbology in a so-called primitive architecture or primitive world but this very oxymoron shows clearly that what we call primitive is not primitive at all. Again, how many architects today think of expressing through their buildings esoteric knowledge or esoteric symbology? You know the answer. Almost none. Primitive and yet powerful architects. I don't know if it's so primitive, and this one in particular, I don't know if it's so uh, uh, powerful, but this one I like very much, very much. I love it. This is architecture. It's whimsical, it's fragile, it's strong, it's perishable, it's imaginative, it's crazy, it's dynamic, it's dreamlike, it's everything. And it puts to shame the timid, tamed architects of today as this one as well. Now I show here a, a, a contemporary project by an architect that I know, uh, Shahira Hamad from Egypt, but now she's in the United States in New York, and she did a project for a tattoo academy in Melbourne, Australia, which tries to recuperate some, some of the, that spontaneous order that we noticed in uh, the so-called primitive architecture or architecture without architects. And I'll show you the project. Uh, she studied also in Vienna uh, at the postgraduate program Excessive run by uh, Hernan Diaz Alonso. And uh, she did this project after she graduated in that uh, postgraduate uh, program in Vienna at the Institute of Architecture. He was actually, she was actually weaving an architecture, which, which in many ways resembles what we saw previously in those examples of uh, so-called uh, architecture without architects. 
it's a woven architecture. You see the plan on the corner, the right uh, uh, lower corner. And some, I will show you some more details. It's called warp and woof, like in weaving. And, uh, you know, I, I find it, uh, uh, she was also inspired by, th this is a drawing she did, Shakira Hamad in pencil, where she allowed her imagination and her graphic uh, abilities to explore forms of organization which are not uh, based on the Cartesian grid, but they explore what the scientists call now in nature spontaneous order. Another drawing by Shakira Hamad. Now, of course, what she does now in order to earn a living in New York City is different from what we see here. Uh, this is another, another page from her project in, in, that, in that competition. And uh, again, uh, you know, drawings, exploring, uh, having different kinds of sources of inspiration for her project. Uh, and uh, these are her digital uh, uh, explorations through Maya where she was trying to weave is like in basketry. It's, a, it's an embroidered architecture. Now, of course, it's just on paper, but I think it's important to, to, to explore in this way as well. And, 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 and to allow your imagination to, to act uh, as unrestricted uh, as possible, but this does not mean that uh, in uh, unrestricted, in uh, unknown, un unknown ways. Now, Benedetta Taliabue, with her Spanish pavilion in Shanghai, the Shanghai Expo in 2010, she also explored the power of weaving, and here it is. And I think she did a good job. Now, of course, behind this woven material textile work, or panels, mobile panels, there is a steel structure. So this building is uh, as a hybrid, uh, uh, you know, physiology. But, but, but I think uh, nevertheless is a courageous attempt to bring an architecture of uh, surprise, surprise. And, uh, you know, uh, the femininity of weaving, let's not forget all the goddesses of weaving were goddesses, not gods, for the Egyptians, for the Scandinavians, for the Greeks, like Ariadna, for the Hindus. Uh, and uh, this is something worth contemplating, you know, the femininity of architecture through weaving. Benedetta Taliabue in Spain, in uh, Shanghai, but she lives in, and works in Barcelona. I, I chose to show also these uh, few examples of contemporary work because I think it's important to try to connect, you know, uh, distant themes or distant realities with our own time. And, and, and see if it's not possible to recuperate some of the qualities that we see in architecture without architects in the present. Now, this is, uh, you know, something that is foreign to us, you know, uh, uh, as, as this image is foreign to us. Look at this, those people, the builder of this, it's a church, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a sacred building. Look at them erecting it, you know, risking their lives to build it. It's amazing. It's an amazing picture. I mean, you know, students study for years in universities and they never imagine the joy that these people, I'm sure, had erecting this building. Yes, there was effort too. Maybe at times frustrations, but it was the frustration of the discoverer, of the pioneer, climbing on the, mount on the, on the mountain of a building in order to bring it to fruition. I, no, really, you know, we think that we evolved formidably, formidably, because we have refrigerators, we have cars, we have asphalted roads, we have so-called infrastructure. Well, you know, but, but we'll, never, we'll never have the joy that these people had. No, 
because we are not children any longer. We don't know what it means to, you know, to, to even to live dangerously. We are too protected and too cushioned and too afraid, essentially. We are afraid, very afraid. We are afraid to live. Look at this building. Uh, something like this would not be proposed in a so-called serious school of architecture. No way. You know, uh, or, or such a building, which is not an insult to the earth, which doesn't pollute, but excuse me, it's not in concrete. How could we build something like this? You know, where is the engineer? You know, uh, what about these buildings? Were they done with engineers, with stamps, with signatures, with committees approving them? No, of course not. And we complicated ourselves so much. This is the same book, Primitive Architecture, but uh, this is not with hard covers. It's a newer edition published by Electa Rizzoli. Itself a very nice book, and I would recommend it to anyone by Enrico Guidoni. And it's one of the 18 volumes of the history of old architecture on primitive architecture, and in my opinion, is the best. the sacred building and the animals in front and the man with a bicycle. Nice. No heliport, no uh, subterranean parking for 300 cars. Now look at this building, which is sliced like a bread. You know, it was uh, made actually of those slices. It's like going in reverse here. Strange. Other interesting buildings. We are going to see others when I show the Dogon architecture. Now, if we could bring something into our world inspired by what we call primitive architecture or architecture without architects would be great. But I don't see science of doing this because we are too indoctrinated and too afraid. And plus, we, we won't get rid of our rationalistic uh, Cartesian uh, uh, you know, longings. No, no, we have to be in control. We have to be safe. You know, we have to have air conditioning, we have to have a certain temperature in the rooms, you know, we, in the winter it has to be warm and in the summer it has to be cold. And in the night we have to have electricity to deny the darkness that God gave us on night. No, no, and no even to Hassan Fatih. And this is a building by him. But again and again, who taught these, these people the art of building? Nobody. Nobody. Who teaches a child to be the castle in sand at the edge of the sea? Nobody. Now you could say it's much easier to build in sand at the, end of, at the edge of the sea. Maybe. Maybe, but let's not forget what Picasso said. I, I learned to paint like Raphael in four years, and I learned to paint like a child a whole life or a whole lifetime. So maybe if we learn, you know, the, the, the peak of our development to become children again, that is to become again in a way so-called primitive, would be a great addition to our... Um, you know, uh, archive of uh, qualities. But well, I'm afraid we still have to be specialists, you know, and mercenaries to, be, to do only do things because we are paid. But uh, these people build for themselves. Uh, I'm sure they struggle. I'm sure they don't have refrigerators. I'm sure they, they maybe barely eat. And yet, the erection of this building in conditions of freedom, I'm sure, was, was a challenge and a joy for them. If you look, look at that, I don't know how to call it, chalet, you know? Uh, uh, look, at the, look at the artworks inscribed on the, on the fascia of the, of the building, you know? It's, this is inconceivable for us because we think we are emancipated. 
but it's not emancipation. It's actually a poverty, poverty of imagination. But look at this building. Or this, is it expressive? I think it is. Does it belong to the Dogon region in Mali? Yes, it does. No wonder it is protected by UNESCO because it is beautiful. And we are going to see other examples of the Dogon uh, architecture, which I admire so much. And look at this door, at the entrance door. It is emphasized its framing, which does not quite exist, except what we see, through that whiteness, you know, some splashed whiteness on a facade which is not white otherwise. Is it bad? I don't think it's bad at all. In fact, uh, even Jean Nouvel uh, attempted uh, some gestures towards, uh, you know, uh, they, they, this kind of uh, spontaneity in one of his projects, if I remember correctly. Now look here, this is of course the house of a shaman. And this is a narrative architecture. The facade of the building shows, says something about its inhabitant. A shaman, what is that? I mean, if we design a house for a doctor today, let's say a cardiologist or a surgeon, do we individualize that project, that house, according to the, you know, to the function that the inhabitant plays in society? Of course not. If we have a football player and a surgeon with the same amount of money, with the same plot of land, with the same requirements for their buildings, I'm sure we will not differentiate between the two buildings. We'll build the same building for two different kinds of people with different uh, functions in society, uh, with different education, different knowledge, and so on. Here, the house of the shaman is different from the houses of other people. It, the building tells the story of its inhabitant. That's what I meant by quoting from Bas Gaston Bachelard, who said the mollusk doesn't live doesn't build in order to live in the building, but lives in order to build a building. And, 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 and so the building is a culmination of a lived life, is the expression of a lived life. And this is not happening in our architecture. Villa Savoie doesn't say anything about the Savoie family. Falling Water Building by Frank Lloyd Wright doesn't say anything about the Kaufman uh, family. The two buildings only say something about the architects, but not about the inhabitants. Here, the building tells us about uh, something, and powerfully, about the inhabitant, not about the builder. This is a narrative architecture. Now look at, look at, look at these whimsical structures, you know, done in conditions of freedom, in the absence of inhibition, spontaneously with some knowledge. And of course, the building has a, a cap, a hat, a humorous one. Nice. And look at this elevation. My God, my God, <clears throat> who would do something like this today? Nobody. I mean, nobody in the so-called civilized world. No way. We don't even do sculptures any longer or attach cariatids or you know some kinds of statues. No, we only have white walls and the rectangularity and you know taint uh, dreams or no dreams at all. But it's not the case here. Why? Because these people also acknowledge their inner life, dreams or nightmares. The animals that were to be found around the buildings, you know, and, and they connected with that outer world in this way. Or here, a most unusual elevation, right? No student in architecture in a so-called serious school would do something like this, even in school. It would be considered crazy. It would be considered incomprehensible. It would be considered a joke. And it's not a joke. 
I actually think our rectangularisms are jokes compared to what we see here. Anyway, then look at the builders <laughs> or one of the builders. Or inhabitants or both. It's possible that both. Aren't they beautiful? It's like a family. Four brothers or two brothers and two sisters or three brothers and one sister or three sisters and one brother or the father, the mother and two sons. I don't know. Or two daughters. I don't know. But it's like a family. Dogon, yes. Mali. Life was, was and is harsh, I'm sure. But sometimes I long for this kind of life, you know. Now, of course, I, 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 I long from a distance, from the comfort of our civilized, uh, you know, uh, ambience, uh, from my civilized, so-called civilized interior. It's possible that if I was there, I would not make this presentation in such um, admirative uh, terms. It's possible. I have to look at myself critically as well. Dogon again, and we are going to see a specific presentation about the, the amazing architecture of Dogon. Mali. Earth. Earth on Earth. This is a sanctuary. But <laughs> yeah, how was it born? From an architect sitting at the desk with a white uh, collar shirt and or in front of a laptop, you know, and calculating, subtracting and adding? No, I don't think so. You cannot make something like this in that way. And the builders working hard sweating, but doing something real with their own hands. And look here, these builders. Now you compare the frustr frustrations of the countless students who pass countless exams and never touch a brick or a stone and never climb on, a on, the, on the mountainous building as these people do. They erected something. Can you imagine the level of accomplishment you know that, that these people arrived at? And I'm absolutely sure they were not forced to do it. Probably not paid either. Amazing. Uh, look at these columns here. Would we think of doing such columns to our buildings? No way. No, we are civilized. We are highly trained. We are rational. We think, but we don't feel. That's the problem. We didn't transform, I think, therefore I am, into I feel, therefore I am. Not yet. At the most, or maybe not at the most, we transformed Descartes' words I think, therefore I am, into I show, therefore I am. And this is the plan, you know, of a little human settlement it's like the face like a human face in plan you know and look at the functions the town hall is number one it's here it's not in the center number two i don't even see it where is it number two the blacksmith i don't see it but it must be here number three really square it's the square four house there are some houses here, which the eyes and the nose, right? Then five women, five. They are the, the jewels, the earrings, you know? Uh, some, some specialized, special buildings for the women here. 
in plan the jewels, the you know the earrings, smaller uh, number six. <clears throat> I don't know what this is. Seven village altar, <clears throat> altar, uh, and uh, eight other altars. Are we more sophisticated than these people? Do we have esoteric symbolism in our works? No way. Another, I cannot call it village, although maybe I could, very small. Round buildings. Well, these people must have plenty of money if they afford round buildings, conical or cylindrical, you know, cylindrical. No way. They are, you know, some of the poorest people on this earth. But why did they build in this way? And not with the, you know, apparently the the most, um, you know, economical rectangular Cartesian way. This architecture is kind of, uh, you know, dreamlike and womb like It's it's it's. It's an architecture that is clearly not estranged from the fundamental source of life, uh, from those uh, impulses that animate uh, us maybe perhaps more uh, during the night when we sleep than during the day when we are so-called awake. But are we truly awake? I doubt it. Oh, we see here ornaments, right? Why did they why did they go through the trouble to ornament these uh, humble dwellings? Because it's in the human nature to quest a little bit for some beauty. That's why. The house of the spiritual leader, we already saw such a thing, maybe it's the same thing. Look at details of the spiritual leader. I mean that they, they could be seen as morbid by uh, by us, and they are and, and if we consider the skulls as, as you know, being um, unbearable to look at, but the spiritual leader uh, understood something that we forgot, that between life and death, there is an, uh, an intimate relationship. Life becomes death, death becomes life. We are born in order to die. Other interesting uh, facades. Now look at these buildings. Why did they make? It's clear. It's a clear aesthetical uh, concern here or intention, right? Here and here, you know. It's it's they are like faces in a way, you know. And 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 and, and yes, this elevation is different from the side elevation. The so-called primitive man was not so primitive after all. Dog on again. Uh, these, they, they erected these buildings without projects. It's an architecture without projects. I don't know what this is, but I like. Um, with these uh, base reliefs, you know, there was a lot of uh, work here, hard work, but artistry as well. Yemen clay architecture, a remarkable architecture, also a, to an extent architecture without architects, although they had and have their masters, their builders, their knowing people. And uh, they erected the mini Manhattan in Sana and other places in Yemen. Amazing, amazing buildings in clay. Look at them. These are tall buildings. These are, you know, uh, uh, apartment buildings. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. Yemen. Yeah, uh, it's probably, probably these two last examples are not truly belonging to the architecture without architects, although they didn't have architects, but they had knowing or knowledgeable builders in, in the place where they, they live. And I hope I have other examples. If not, I actually have another presentation just about Yemen architecture because I, I admire it. And, 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 and there are countless examples of 
brilliant building in Yemen. Now, this is a website, a very good one, Miss Pitt's Architecture, and I recommend it to anyone. And, uh, you know, from 2017, it had an entry, Architecture Without Architects. Uh, it's another website that I think I took some, some images from. And there are many, of course. Um, afterthoughts on vernacular and spontaneity. Yes, the, there seems to be a relationship between the vernacular or vernacularity or vernacular architecture and spontaneity. And here I end this uh, first presentation today. <laughs>